Hello and welcome to Telesur on the day that Dominica held general elections to choose a new government. I'm Doris Polo in Quito. The vote count is underway in Dominica's general election and the first results should be through very shortly. The voting passed off very peacefully and there was no sign of the violence or disruption that some had feared. The opposition United Workers Party had mounted roadblocks in recent days to try to stop the vote, while the Secretary General of the OAS and the United States backed the opposition's demands for electoral reform. 21 seats in Parliament are up for grabs. The ruling Labour Party, led by the Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt, and the opposition UWP, led by Lennox Linton, are the two contenders in this race. Opposition leader Lennox Linton, who is contesting the parliamentary seat in Marigot, cast his vote early this morning in his home constituency of Roseau North. Turnout favors us. But the people turning out is great. Uh, we're going to get some showers of blessings, it looks like, uh, the early part of the morning. So, uh, yeah, this is the day. Voting day in Dominica. Voting day when the people of Dominica will make a decision for real change in the Congo. It's looking good. Dominica's Prime Minister called everyone to vote as he cast his ballot. Roosevelt Skerritt and his government have repeatedly promised that the election would be free and fair, as elections always have been in Dominica. Let's go live to our correspondent, Alejandro Kirk, who is at the count in the capital of Dominica Russo. Alejandro, how is the vote count proceeding? Hello, uh, greetings from the uh, electoral office here in downtown uh, Rosso in Dominica. The piles of boxes are arriving here by the minute. The counting is going on. But I have a, a guest here to, who is more qualified than me to talk about what is happening at this time in the counting and in the country too. Uh, this is um, um, Prisca Julian. She's an independent journalist uh, uh, from Dominica, Julian, uh, sorry Prisca, welcome to Telesur. Tell us what's happening, what's going on? Well, right now at the electoral office, what we're getting is a preliminary results from the different polling stations. What happens in the 21 constituencies, each constituency is there are different villages and hamlets, and each of those have polling stations, some of them two or three. So the ballots are being counted, they're being tabulated there, and we are getting the results coming in, and at the end of it all, it's going to be tabulated to, for the entire constituency, for the 21 constituency, to say which of the parties has won that specific constituency. So where we stand right now, so far we have at least 10 of the constituencies where the preliminary results are saying that the Dominica Labour Party is leading, and we have already won unofficially those constituencies. And uh, the political situation, there had been threats, there had, had been some violence last week, threats that they will, opposition will not recognize the elections in case they won't win. Uh, how do you see that? Is that a posture or there is something real behind that? The, well, the opposition has said that they feel on their end that the elections are not as free as they should be in Dominica. However, we did see that the opposition has um, 21 representatives for each constituency who is contesting the election. Um, everyone is registered and they have the people going out to vote for them. So what we what we're hoping, despite the some of the unrest you know that we had during this week and early uh, last week, we so far it's quiet and we're hoping that it continues that way. And with regards to the opposition recognizing this election, we can only hope that it continues to be a peaceful thing and that it is not uh, considered to be something that's unfair, which would you know uh, tell bad for the for the country and and are all elections in dominica as peaceful as this uh, we were expecting some sort of uh, turmoil some sort of debates uh, you know passion and what we saw was a sort of very professional cool thing that that raised no no violence yes. Even as uh, throughout the day that I passed along and, and different polling stations, everything was quiet. There was a hush. Everybody was going along, uh, minding their business and doing things in order. There was no polling station where there was any uproar or there was uh, anything going on where, where things were disturbed. 
you know so we are we are expecting that continuing through the night that this will maintain as we stand in the city now i mean we're from where we are at the electoral office we can tell that even in the town that things are very quiet which normally would be the first place that you might hear something given the events of last week and so on but nothing is going on and we are quite thankful for that and you know, despite what has been out there to say that, uh, you know, there has been a lot of unrest, civil unrest and so on, this is right now just not the case. And when are, can we expect the final results? The final, well, most of the constituencies, um, the polling stations have already started giving their information. So we're hoping maybe by the, the next hour and a half or so, because we want to, everything has to be tabulated for each constituency, even after each polling station has given their information. And so after that, it has to be tabulated, and at the end of it, an official thing is said. So maybe in about an hour and a half or so, because a number of the constituencies have been bringing in their, their boxes. Okay, thank you very much, Priska. That's uh, what I have for now. Over to you, Quito. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Mal, what I would like to ask you, though, is what can you tell us about what you saw personally on the ground? Because you've mentioned that it was a peaceful uh, voting process and that there weren't the protests that we were expecting to see. What else could you tell us about today's events? Well, really, uh, to me, as a, you know, an individual, it was very surprising to see the, the quietness that uh, this uh, election was characterized by for. Um, no demonstrations, even you know when the counting started, everybody was disciplined. They locked the, the, the doors of the um, polling stations and the counting took place with the three officials um, appointed there. Um, one policeman and two, uh, one representative of each of the main parties uh, in contest. So uh, at the end of it, uh, the streets were kind of empty, but we did see some celebrations uh, going on in the city by the uh, uh, Labour Party. I don't know if this reflects uh, any low knowledge better than the one we have, uh, what now Priska just told us, but uh, on the whole it seems that there, there will be no surprises at least for tonight. Thank you so much for providing us with that update, Alejandro, and I know you will keep us informed as these elections and this election comes to an end. Now, several observer missions are accompanying the elections in Dominica. Telesur spoke to Nicanor Moscoso of CELA, the Council of Latin American Electoral Experts, about the role of the observers. Our mission considers that in no way should any of the international missions from the United Nations, the European Union, the OAS or any other body intervene in the elections, much less should they deliver a so-called verdict at the end of the day. We should show respect and allow each of the electoral authorities, the political parties and the candidates to resolve any differences that might arise. Those are our norms. We have come to accompany the vote and in the future we will offer our observations and any recommendations for how the process can be constantly improved. Now, as Alejandro Kurt noted, Dominica's right-wing opposition had previously set up roadblocks in an attempt to stop these elections. As the government ordered the police to clear the roads, violence has hit an important sector of the economy, tourism. When cruise ships dock here, Dominica gets excited and blooms. Tons of beer are sold in bars like this. Ladies sell handicrafts and souvenirs, and taxis take visitors to the jungle. Not these days. Now they have to chase whoever shows up. The vessels did not come. You have the opposition, you know, the supporters blocking the road, and, and they block the airport. Here I supposed to bring people that live in the island to the airport to take a plane, they cannot do that. Then cruise ships, um, supposed to come, no cruise ships. And the business for taxi drivers and the poor people suffering real bad. So did the Prime Minister warn. We awoke this morning to the hurtful news of the cancellation of some flights by Seaborne Airlines due to the hooliganism of the supporters of the opposition. I must also inform you that the cruise lines which visit our shores are now also contemplating 
whether they will suspend calls on Dominica indefinitely. Any cruise ship disembarks over 10% of Rosso's population. You see, um, right now we're in a cruise ship season, and when we have a lot of ships, this is actually the party spot. You know, it's close to the dock, everything. So everybody come here to party. After that, it's gone. Well, business has been slow because the ships are not coming back until maybe after election, I don't know. Well, I mean, they're protesting for their rights, but at the same time, it is offending us, some of us. It is not just beer what Dominica has to offer. Our, our country is primarily um, dependent on agriculture, but what we have done is to twin the two together. So when persons come to Dominica, we ensure that they experience a Dominican experience in terms of the food, the drink that we have to offer. So these actions impact not only the, the tourism sector, but it's also impacting the agricultural sector because all of these agricultural persons, the fish, the, um, the vegetables, the fruits, they provide those to the hotels and in turn the visitors um, partake in these and enjoy them. Is built up over many years. Breaking it takes nothing. Tourism, it should be in the region about $350 million in terms of the economic impact into the country. Well, clearly, it's very unfortunate that the opposition has taken a stance to, to use violence to bring the point across. And it's very sad that it has a, a very negative impact on the economy of Dominica. The electoral process is in full gear. Attempts to stop it have failed. Yet, the opposition has warned that should it not win, it will not recognize its results. Jesus Romero and Alejandro Kirk, Telesur, Dominica. Now, the government of Roosevelt Garrett prides itself on its work to reconstruct Dominica after the island was devastated by Hurricane Maria in 2017. Peter Wickham of Cadres in Barbados says that, on the whole, voters saw the government's response to Hurricane Maria quite positively. My sense uh, regarding Hurricane Maria is that that was one of the primary issues. And the interesting thing is that as the election approached, the, sh the issue shifted from Hurricane Maria to the question of, you know, the economy, the cost of living, things of that nature. Crime was a very low level of concern. Uh, so people were just concerned about the broader economic direction. The fact that Hurricane Maria was not high on the priority list uh, basically said to me that government was rated well. And certainly when we asked people how they rated the government's performance in relation to the Maria recovery, um, you know, it was a B plus or A average on, on you know, in, entirely. People felt that the government's performance regarding the recovery from the hurricane was exemplary uh, and it was something to be cherished. Um, and as I said, I think Dominicans have moved past that and they're now at the question of saying, okay, where do we go from here as far as development was concerned? That seemed to have been the primary issue on voters' minds at the time. When we return, an update on the situation in Bolivia after President Evo Morales was deposed and many were killed in the violent repression of anti-coup demonstrations. Stay with us. Welcome back. Bolivia's lower house has passed the law on guarantees for the full exercise of constitutional rights. The bill seeks to ensure compensation for the families of those who were killed and injured during the social uprising last month and to grant constitutional guarantees to lawmakers. The bill still has to go to the Senate. After more than 11 hours of debate, Law 511 has finally been approved, both in general and in detail. There were many issues raised by the opposition as well as current government. There's been some misinformation, but this was finally clarified. I want to make it clear to the Bolivian people that this law is the consolidation of the agreements reached with the Bishops' Conference, the United Nations and some other international bodies which have been mediators together with the government and our movement towards socialism representatives. In this dialogue, a number of agreements were reached to pacify the country. This law that guarantees constitutional rights does not seek impunity. And those authorities who have been investigated and have been identified as the perpetrators of crimes must be punished. Our correspondent on the ground in La Paz, Mateo Grie, has more on that. 
In the early morning, Bolivia's lower house approved the law of guarantees, which was proposed by the movement towards socialism. It was approved by two-thirds. They are looking to guarantee the free exercise of civic and political rights of all Bolivian citizens. Why is such a law necessary? Well, the movement towards socialism will say that they are experiencing political and ideological persecution, targeting the leaders of the mass, but also against union and social leaders who naturally are not in agreement with the de facto government of Janine Agnes. This law also proposes that they compensate the families of the victims of those who died in repression of Sacaba and Sencata, and that they guarantee the health care coverage of those injured by the repression. Additionally, this law of guarantees proposes that they accept the safe conduct so those who are being politically persecuted and who wish to seek asylum in other countries, and where those countries have accepted the request, be provided that safe conduct so they are able to complete that asylum. This is one of the guarantees which was debated for more than 12 hours in the lower house of Bolivia, but ultimately was approved by more than two-thirds, which will now proceed to the Senate. The de facto president, Janine Añez, has said that she will veto the law, so from there another discussion will take place, as the Senate is, of course, also expected to approve the law of guarantees. And the OAS has released its final report of the audit on the Bolivian elections. The report, which took nearly a month, claims that there was malicious manipulation and serious irregularities, which made it impossible to validate the results. Morales, in exile in Mexico, had denounced the OAS for its delay and failure to publish the final report. The report looks much like the preliminary one used to argue fraud and justify the coup against President Evo Morales. The Center for Economic and Policy Research took to Twitter rejecting the OAS final audit report on Bolivia's elections. It said, quote, the report repeats the worst errors of their previous work and introduces more. This is not an objective audit. We'll have a response soon. CEPR will publish an in-depth review in the coming days, end quote. Last Thursday night in Cochabamba, residents of the Zona Sud lined up to sign their support for the People's Ombudsman representative in Cochabamba, Nelson Cox. Cox and his family have faced persecution in response to his investigative work following the coup. The Departmental Ombudsman's Office has faced threats for its work investigating the Sacaba massacre. Shifting gears now, as Colombians continue their protests against the government's austerity measures, a concert was held on Thursday night to celebrate the culture of those who have been resisting for 500 years and who remain forgotten by President Ivan Duque. They tune each instrument, test the strings and rehearse. Musicians from different parts of Colombia united in the People's Philharmonic for a special show. This is a tribute to the indigenous guard. It hasn't been done for more than 500 years, because the indigenous guard came from Cauca to support the national strike, a very important movement where we are seeking dialogue. They are using instruments brought to the Americas by the colonizers. Here they are mixed with protest songs in a concert entitled Resistance for Life. What we are doing is based on the meeting of two cultures. This concert is in honor of the greatest resistance ever in the world. Everything is ready and then the indigenous guard were welcomed to this performance. The rights of the people cannot be negotiated. We come to demand respect for life, for the land, and for peace, because the government has not implemented the agreements. In his campaign, the president promised not to increase taxes, but he's done the opposite. 
We are troubled by what is happening to the Colombian people. That is why the struggle of the students, campesinos and Afro-Colombians is also our struggle. Flags wave in recognition of Colombia's ancestral peoples. Now they hope that this song to demand social rights is heard in the talks with the government, which for now are stalled. In other news, at least 58 people have died in a shipwreck off the coast of Mauritania on Wednesday. 85 survivors were rescued and received assistance from local authorities, 10 of whom were hospitalized. According to the Interior Ministry, the boat carried more than 150 people, mostly immigrants, trying to reach Spain from Gambia. Survivors told officials that the boat left Gambia on November 27th and ran out of fuel. The Gambian government said that it will send a delegation to investigate the accident. I am Gia Alpha Sungo for the Republic of Senegal. I am currently living in the Gambia. Now I am in Nogudibu. I were on a journey to Spain for better work. It was a cruel journey, and we were deceived. Thank God we were rescued and taken care of. Thanks to Mauritania. Dozens of Afghans have marched against the killing of Japanese doctor and aid worker Tetsu Nakamura. Nakamura and five others were murdered by unknown gunmen in the east of the country. Media reports say authorities were waiting to take Nakamura's body to his family, who are expected to arrive in Kabul on Friday. Nakamura was the head of Peace Japan Medical Services and had recently been granted honorary Afghan citizenship for decades of humanitarian work. The killing of Dr. Nakamura is a very big shame on the Afghan government because this crime-ridden state spends thousands of dollars to protect the people who turn Afghanistan into ruins. But it didn't do anything to protect the life of a man who came here and did a lot for the Afghan people. Activists in Iraq have joined a march commemorating the Syria residents killed in anti-government demonstrations. They carried coffins and demanded justice for 46 people who died after security forces opened fire on them. Paramedics noted that they tended to scores of lethal wounds from rifles and machine guns against unarmed protesters. More than 400 protesters and a dozen members of the security forces have died in the unrest, including nearly 100 people in Nasiriya. Iraq's government denies the repression and blames violence on unidentified saboteurs. He went out to demand for his rights, his legitimate rights, like work, a decent living, to be comfortable in this country. He walked out with an Iraqi flag in his hands, only to be faced with live fire by the security forces. This march is emblematic for Iraq, and especially for Nasiriya, the city of martyrs, the city of the revolutionaries. A general strike against pension reform is into its second day in France. On Thursday night, French police fired tear gas at workers in Paris. Over 800,000 workers are estimated to have taken to the streets in protest throughout France on the first day. It was the biggest strike the country has seen since 1995. The CGT and other major unions called the stoppage to try to force President Emmanuel Macron to abandon his plans to increase the retirement age and pension contributions. And travelers faced a second day of chaos as dozens of trains, metros and flights were cancelled due to the strike. Several schools remained closed or offered only daycare. Four of the country's eight oil refineries remained blocked, raising the prospect of fuel shortages. Rail operator SNCF halted ticket sales through the weekend with 90% of high-speed TGV trains again cancelled. The Minister for Ecological Transition and Secretary of State for Transport are now meeting with the managers of the French National Rail Network and Public Transport to discuss the way forward. We'll take a short break now. In a few minutes, we'll be back with much more on the elections in Dominica. Don't go away.